Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm Al, and I am joined by a special guest today. I'm joined by uh, St- Stephen Augustine, who is a convert to the Catholic faith. And he's got quite an interesting story. He's going to tell us about his conversion story. Uh, I I don't know a lot about it myself. I know he um, stopped. I know he was Anglican for a bit, and I know he was something else. But I don't know it all, so he's going to share it. And he's also going to put a large emphasis on the role that St. Augustine played in his conversion. St. Augustine of Hippo, an early, uh, well, I guess not early, but a fifth century Latin father who is very important for medieval theology um, and I guess theology in the early patristic period as well. Uh, right. Stephen, how are you doing? Doing very well, Alan. Thank you for having me on. Uh, it was really nice for you reaching out. I, uh, I'm always talking about my conversion story on social media here and there and everywhere. Um, I can't shut up about it. It's, I uh, came into church in 2018. I still haven't talked Stop talking about it. So uh, let's let's dive let's in. Let's keep maybe. talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So so the question I asked everyone mm-hmm. when they come on my channel is: tell us how you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and end up in the church you're in. And so that's what you're going to tell us. You're going to tell us the role Saint Augustine played yeah. and possibly some other saints that were important on your journey. Sure. Um, but yeah, I'll let you take it away, Stephen. All yours. Thanks. Thanks so much, Alan. Yeah. So, I mean, I really have an unremarkable background as things go. My mom, uh, she's Southern Baptist by her, um, her growing up. She knows nothing but Southern Baptist theology on my dad's side. He grew up Catholic. Um, but I didn't know that because, uh, our home was broken very early on. He, uh, moved back to France and he's a French citizen even to this day. But, um, but all I ever knew growing up was your typical sort of evangelical Baptist theology. Um, around age 11, I started attending a charismatic non-denominational church, uh, in Southern California and, uh, um, never, I, I always kind of grew up believing in Jesus. So I always heard about him, but we didn't really go to church until around, age 11, uh, some life events sort of propelled my mom, who was remarried by then, to uh, go back to church. And uh, so I became baptized at age 12. We had some good folks from the church uh, who were part of what's called Evangelism Explosion. You may or may not know about that from um, the old Dr. James Kennedy, uh, old Dr. James Kennedy fame over at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Florida. He had its program that was used interdenominationally on, on uh, easy ways of presenting the gospel uh, door to door, things like that on the street. So the people from this, huh? Are you, are you from Florida? No, 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 Jane, uh, no, I'm not. But uh, James Kennedy, who, who was the guy that uh, the, the minister of uh, Coral Ridge Presbyterian church, he created this program for Christians of all stripes to use to help facilitate evangelism. So, uh, we had some people knock on our door from the church we were visiting, the charismatic church we were visiting, and they gave us the full gospel presentation. And I'm, I never heard it like that. I, I always believed in God and Jesus, but I didn't hear any gospel presentation before. So uh, I was, by the end of their presentation, crying as an 11-year-old, wanting Jesus in my heart, wanting to uh, become born again, as they would uh, phrase it. And um the following year, I was baptized. Uh, looking back, maybe it was kind of a questionable Trinitarian formula, but um, uh, from what I remember, it was definitely in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And uh, I had basically uh, become a, a very zealous evangelist as a kid in, in junior high and high school. And uh, I've always felt this sort of call to ministry, at least as, as far as I understood it back then. But um, because my dad was already uh, living in France by the time I was 18. I went over to France to visit him. I haven't seen him for years since I was five. You so what had it? Speak French or? Oh, I, I, I spoke enough French to get around. Uh, I didn't take any French in, in, in school. I took German like two years. So I, I had to learn on the fly. <laughs> but, uh, but that said, which was interesting, because here I am a an American in France. I'm living in the studio. Uh, near my dad's house and uh, I looking for some sort of church. All I know is 
uh, sort of Pentecostalism. I didn't mention to you at age 14, I started going to Assemblies of God. So I had this mishmash of charismatic Baptist Pentecostal theology, very fiery though. And, um, but I'm looking for a church in Paris because I, you know, I need something, right? I need fellowship. Uh. And, and there was nothing uh, except I'm looking on the Minitel, right? Back then that was the internet. Uh, and there is a place called St. Michael's Anglican Church in Paris. <laughs> I knew about an Anglican church. I mean, I, I, I've heard of it. I've never been to one, but uh, but I'm this fiery Pentecostal thing. Well, they speak English and I can go and, and if anything, I can sort them out. You know, <laughs> I had no idea what to expect. I've heard about people being Episcopalian and they have liturgy and stuff. I was like, ah, whatever. It is actually a low church uh, uh, situation. They're very evangelical. But what I was struck with is they still had the Book of Common Prayer. And I remember kind of one night peeking around, I saw the 1662 prayer book there and I picked it up, um, started leafing through it. And I was like struck by how antique everything felt not just the fact that it was elizabethan english it was uh there was just very old creeds very old uh, theology seemed to you know permeate it and i'm sure uh, the other paul would pr appreciate this point right this is not what you get at your typical megachurch evangelical situation um so straight away that sort of lodged in my head as wow this is very different very nice people. I mean, uh, you had some charismatic Anglicans there. You had Calvinist, the, the rector at the time, the vicar, I mean. He was a Calvinist charismatic. That was the first time I ever met anybody like that. I was always told wow. to stay away from Calvinism because it was very evil, right, as a as a Pentecostal. <laughs> but um, It is evil. I agree. It is. The Catholics, <laughs> it is. The Catholics said the Pentecostals agree on something it's, here. Well, of course, but, you know, for my, my 18, 19-year-old Pentecostal self, I'm thinking you can't touch the stuff, you know, because the evils of predestination and, and whatever else. But, but the reality is, um, is this, 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 uh, rector sat me down and started, uh, going through the book of Ephesians. He, he saw my zeal as a Pentecostal. He said, I want to sit you down with the book of Ephesians. He, he started doing a study with me and it's, uh, um, I remember when we got to the whole uh, section of Ephesians, well, early on, of course, about predestination, a little glimmer got in my eye. I, I didn't think much of it, but it kind of was like, wow, that's that's very interesting. He didn't press it on me. He just wanted me to see grace, I think, because I think he felt I had a lot of legalism or something. It was funny. Uh, they were after um, after a service, they were getting together in the fellowship hall. They were having wine. These are all the 18, 19 or yeah, 20 years olds. And as you know, in France, you can drink if you're oh, 16 yeah. and up. Yeah. Cool. So I'm like, yeah, you have wine for every meal in France. that's right. <laughs> and so I kind of raised my hand and said, hey, guys, you know, the Bible's sort of against all of this. <laughs> And the, uh, I remember I got, I got publicly sort of reprimanded by the rector. He's like, look, you know, you that first of all, the, the Bible nowhere says this, but second of all, don't take your, your piety and come here and impose it on us. We're very free in this. We have Liberty. And I mean, I just got, I got an earful from the rector and I, I, I like in all innocence, French. I was just trying don't to tell us not to do that. <laughs> that's right. And I was like, and it's funny because, uh, the next night, uh, the youth pastor took us all out to, to a cafe and he said, here, let me get you a beer. I'm like, okay. I was feeling a little bit, you know, strange, but um, that really broke that taboo. Uh, even as as a charismatic, I was drinking at the time. I was like, well, this isn't so bad. I'm not getting smashed. I'm, you know, we're just enjoying fellowship. So that was a big plus for me uh, as far as becoming, you know, uh, encountering Anglicans. But um, but I don't want to linger too long there. My point is, uh, I stayed in France for a year or two, and then coming back to the states. Um, <clears throat> I got involved with, uh, looking for some sort of Pentecostal ministry. I got involved with a uh, teen challenge in Florida, uh, doing this, uh, sort of like drug rehab ministry. And this was in Sanford, Florida. And, uh, it's very interesting because this was right after hurricane Andrew, um, in Florida. And, and that was what 92, right? So. I was there in 93 and we had to raise money for the organization. And I had found in one of these cars, we were detailing. We did these car detailings, raise money. And one of these cars had that we rescued from the storm to detail, I guess. Um, There's a box of reformed Baptist literature in it. And, and me, I'm, I don't know anything about reformed Baptist. I just saw a bunch of gospel tracts and books. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Let me take it back and read it. 
So this was the death knell to my Pentecostalism because what had happened is I, I one of the first things I picked up was a track by Charles Spurgeon, who is called any of your uh, reformed guests would know is called the Prince of Preachers in, in reform circles because he was a very famous uh, 19th century uh, London preacher, reformed Baptist fellow. And uh, his sermons were quite good, if you've ever read them. I mean, in terms of uh, style and, and passion, they're, they're phenomenal. But uh, what was interesting, what struck me about this tract was it said, uh, the defense of Calvinism as the gospel. That's what I saw in it. Now, I've only heard Calvinism in, when in high school from Pentecostals will say, don't touch it because it's demonic. It's the anti-gospel. That's right. It's anti god <laughs> That's right. So... I was like, ooh, that's kind of interesting. What a very interesting claim that it's a defense of that as the gospel. I was like, all right, let me just start reading it. It wasn't that big of a booklet. And so this is what the header of that, that tract says. And, and I've got it in front of me, so I'm going to read this, this little bit here. It says, uh, the old truth that Calvin preached, right? I was like, Calvin, okay, I kind of know who he is. That Augustine preached. I heard the name of Gus. I knew nothing other than that. He was like a really old timey guy that Paul preached. Well, I knew Paul and, and, and Spurgeon says is the truth that I must preach today. Right? So he's saying that he's making a tie between Augustine, Calvin and Paul. I was like, huh? Okay. Or else be false to my conscience and my God. I cannot shape the truth. I know of no such thing as uh, paring off the rough edges of a doctrine. John Knox's gospel is my gospel. That which thundered through Scotland must be thundered through England again. Okay. So I was like, all right, that's a very interesting way to open up your track. So what is this Augustine, Calvin, Paul tie, right? Um, and then I get, to, I get through halfway and, and he, he, he says something. He says, uh, he writes, I have my own private opinion that there is no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless we preach what nowadays is called Calvinism. It is a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. Okay. Wow. Pretty big. But what's interesting wow. is, yeah, <laughs> let that sink in for a bit. Because here I am, this Arminian, right, for all intents and purposes, know nothing about Calvinism. All I know is you're supposed to shun it. And now he's laying out a case on each of these points, the five points, the famous five points. It's exclusively the gospel, right? That's oh. what they're saying. Oh yeah, and 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 but the the thing is, the lights start coming on because he was able to connect connect these dots, premise on premise, right? It was it felt like such an airtight argument. Uh, it, it really felt revelatory because for this this is the first time I came across a systematic theology that sort of punched you in the teeth and and, and gutted you with like you're like wow. I mean, when you're eighteen or when you're 19, 20 years old by this time, you don't have any categories on how to deal with this this is just wow all these biblical uh, verses about depravity and predestination and perseverance of the saints and irresistible all this was coming together i was like and and i felt like wow i just discovered the pearl of great price i mean this is how it how the experience was and of course you as you might guess team challenge being a a uh, pentecostal organization didn't take too kindly that i was telling these drug rehab fellows about the gospel <laughs> <laughs> and they even got called before. Oh, yeah. Oh, I thought you were going to ask me a question. Sorry. Oh, um, no, 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 no. And, uh, and so I got called before the, the leader of, of that organization there in Sanford. And they said, look, we understand that you come across some literature, and, but we can't have you teaching these guys about Calvinism. You know? So they basically booted me because <laughs> like, people were starting to catch on. Yep. So, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to fill in all the details, but basically in South Florida, I was uh, at a point because what had happened was I had these names in my head. I have Augustine, I have Calvin in my head. And, um, and what I understood from that was that it seems like the Reformation, as, as Spurgeon was teaching, was, you know, you have a guy named Calvin who wasn't a Baptist that I soon learned. But it seemed like there's sort of this alliance, right? You have Baptists, you have Presbyterians. So there's this broader thing called the Reformation. So I was like, well, I mean, if if there's an if you can be an ally of John Knox and John Calvin who aren't Baptists, maybe I need to, you know, find some sort of Protestant church that's 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 reformed. I couldn't find a reformed Baptist church where I was at. So I picked up the yellow pages 
And and where were you at at this time? This was South Florida at, at, the, at this time. So, um, L- L- so Orlando. Uh, it would have been South, like uh, West Palm Beach area, you know. And uh, and so I, my eyes lighted on this ad in the yellow pages back in the day before the internet was a thing. <laughs> and it said Orthodox Presbyterian Church, OPC. I was like, wow, Orthodox Presbyterian. That sounds good. It sounds like they're straight with their teaching. So I called the pastor and I said, Hey, I just discovered this thing called Calvinism. Calvinism. Do you guys teach this reform stuff? And of course, you know, he said, he sounded as happy as a kid in a candy shop. He's like, yeah, we do that. We love it. We love it. And come on over and visit. So, um, he, you know, he was very eager to teach me more about Calvinism. So, uh, I basically stayed within that reform tradition for a better part of five years. Um, uh, it, it just seemed logical for me to to camp out there because I wanted to know as much as I could about Calvinism. So at that moment, as soon as I started going to this OPC church, I bought myself uh, the institutes, Calvin's institutes, and I and I devoured them. I, I forgot how many, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever, but I, I was single. I had no attachments. I could spend all my time reading. Right. So uh, I digested Calvin as much as I could. And uh, this is where things start getting pretty interesting because um you know, here I'm thinking I'm going to go to seminary. I'm going to be a Presbyterian pastor one day. And so I had no expectation I would be anywhere else. Um, but what, what happened is I noticed something funny. This is pretty early on. Calvin was saying in his prefatory address to King Francis I, who, by the way, he wasn't a committed Protestant or anything. He, he actually booted Calvin and, and other Protestants out uh, a few years later after, uh, I think around 1540, if I remember. But yeah, but, the but point is, is that, oh, sorry. Uh-huh. No, go well, ahead. no, I'm just saying that 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 although he was not Protestant himself, he kind of gave fuel to the movement because he declared w- war on the Holy R- Roman Empire. Very um, political. Yep. At, which, like, like, and of course, they're the ones under King Charles trying to suppress the Protestants. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. It's harder to deal with internal problems when your borders are in danger with the the French on one side and the the Turks on the other, you know. That's so right. Oh no, I mean war. the political turmoil is fantastic and people that try to sell you on this was just purely a theological movement or revival is just they're selling you a bill of goods. There was so much oh, political it, intrigue at this time. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh but but what I came across in reading the prefatory address, something that kind of struck me as interesting was uh, Calvin says this and, and and he he's trying to sell King Francis on the Protestant movement. He's trying to say, look, what we're doing here is this is just, we're just getting back to the roots. We're trying to purify what's going on. And, and we are being lied about, you know, he's given a mini apologetic in this prefatory address. So Calvin says in one part of the prefatory address, he says, it is a calumny to represent us as opposed to the fathers, right? The church fathers. And in and, and parentheses, he says, and I mean, the ancient writers of a pure age. So I'm imagining he's being pre-medieval, of course. Uh, first, first 400 years, 500 years, typically there. Uh, as if the fathers were supporters of their impiety, their impiety, meaning the papists, right? Uh, were the contest to be decided by such authority to speak moderate, moderately or modestly here, the better part of the victory would be ours. And I think the McNeil version says the tide of victory would be ours or something like that. But but Calvin's making some pretty. What bold translation uh, are you using? I pulled this off, and, and this is just so I could have uh, excerpts. I pulled this off the. Uh, I think this is ba- battles. I think I'll, I'll have to double check. Mine is uh, a, beverage or beverage. Yeah, I think yeah, it's either beverage or battles. I think it's beverage. I can't there's remember. Beverage. There's mm-hmm. Allen. Um, I think w- one of them is made from the French. French, well, m- most of them are made from Latin because yeah. it was originally written in Latin, um, right. and 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 of course translated into French because that was pertinent of the of the, the area he's trying to preach to, sure. right? France, Switzerland. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, go uh, continue. He's saying that 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 his movements, the Church of the Fathers. Well, I mean, so to to be clear, he, no nowhere does he. St- say in in the institutes that the fathers are a mirror of what we're doing i mean he doesn't go that far but he what he's he's suggesting here is that if you read the fathers they will basically be on our side right 
the papists will be will be all uh, uh, slayed by what we find in the fathers. So it's funny because at this time, as a as a young Presbyterian, I'm reading books by Michael Horton. I'm listening to the White Horse Inn. I uh, I bought uh, I bought a book called uh, Mission Accomplished by Michael Horton. He wrote it while he was a Reformed Episcopalian. And uh, what's very interesting about it is, other than the, being a defense of the five points of Calvinism, in the back there's an appendix of all these church fathers proving, you know, the Calvinistic faith was sort of floating around in some form or fashion in the first 500 years of the church or something like that. And I was reading, I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive, right? So I'm getting all this information, not only from uh, uh, people like Horton, of course, Calvin saying this, but then you have Benjamin Warfield, right, saying, you know, Cal Calvinism is nothing more than a, a, a triumph of Augustinianism, things like this. Um, so, of course, we're programmed. I mean, and, and this is sincerely held belief, but we, we are taught that, yeah, yeah, there were some maybe some issues in the fathers. But by and large, all this Romans, Romanist stuff is just aberration. It's just it's just a uh, it's just a collection of, of of superstitions that sort of uh, like barnacles on a ship collected over centuries. So here I'm thinking this will be great. Calvin is saying that the fathers are on our side. I'm thinking how can I reach out to those poor stupid Catholics, right? I'm thinking this will be a great way of reaching out to them, a bridge, as it were, because I'm very evangelistic. Remember, so, <laughs> and I was very anti-Roman because uh, uh, I took on the uh, uh, the Pope is Antichrist kind of mentality very early on yeah that <laughs> garbage yeah but you you know but then again this is all exciting for a guy that didn't grow up with really any good theology i'm thinking man i've i've discovered the true gold mine of, of christian history here so yeah, well, i took that hmm? uh, i'm curious had you re read any catholic books at this time or was it only protestant stuff so uh, the only Catholic books, and I was about to get to that, was I did pick up an old uh, copy of uh, Aquinas' Summa. It was, it was completely in Latin, so I didn't know how to read it. But it was cool because it was, it was Aquinas. And, it, and I remember R.C. Sproul talking about Aquinas. But I did pick up Augustine's uh, essential writings, uh, his anti-Pelagian writings. I found that oh, as a, a, it was a old used copy for like a dollar. I was like, great, it's Augustine, right? It's like basically my Calvinist dude from the 400s. <laughs> so uh, so at this time, that's the only Catholic literature I'm reading is Augustine, essentially. And I'm thinking, and I'm, of course, I'm reading his words with the Calvinist lens on. So all I'm seeing everywhere is Tulip, right? Whatever he says, anytime mm -hmm. he's talking about predestination or, or, or perseverance or anything. When I see perseverance, I'm thinking... Perseverance of the Saints, right? There's P. Not there's knowing. P of Tulip, yeah. yeah, there's your P, right? So, um, but of course, it's all very naive of me. And, um, but I took, I took Calvin's uh, quote to be an invitation, a real invitation to dive into the fathers. Because I felt, well, if Augustine's safe and this Michael Horton guy is saying there's other fathers talking this way, what, why not? You know, and, and it wasn't that I was thinking it was a substitute for the Bible because I'm reading the Bible a lot. I'm studying the Bible. I love the scriptures. But I felt like kind of isolated from all of this because the Reformation was the first time as a Christian I felt some connection to church history, right? Prior to Billy Graham kind of thing. And, and so I was like, I want more of this. I want to see the family in, in, in you know, sort of in a panoramic view here. So I'm thinking the fathers will be safe. That's a that's a bad mistake, of course, because uh, what I find out later is, is very uh, disconcerting. Uh, but just some some quick facts. So um, I, I realized reading Calvin, I mean, you know, he, he quotes St. Bernard of Clairvaux something, something like 40, 50 times, which I thought was a lot. And I didn't know anything about Bernard. That's the real medieval guy he, he, he approvingly quotes. But Augustine, he quotes well over 350 times, references or quotes in the Institutes. And that tells but, me right there that... But the thing is, the thing is, how could you think Bernard of Clairvaux is a Protestant in any way? Yeah, like, I mean, like the guy was, <laughs> he had five brothers and a sister. He was a monk. Five, mm -hmm. all five of his brothers be became monks. His one sister became a nun. He preached yeah. a crusade, which is uh, in indulgence mm -hmm. and power of the papacy, because pa the papacy gives the indulgence. Like, how is that right. Protestant? 
Well, I, I think what you'll find is Calvin is appealing to, and, and you'll find this, I guess, Luther, who, by the way, said, if there's anybody that you know is elect, it will be Bernard of Clairvaux. I mean, that's that's kind of language Luther used because <sighs> he, Luther and Calvin felt he, they basically got the gospel right on justification and things like that. I mean, right or wrong, that's how they they were reading Bernard. So uh, that, 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 that well, somehow yeah, goes I, with the imputed righteousness of soul. Yeah, it, it, uh, I'm not claiming they were they were brilliant in, in saying so, but I, I think they were looking desperately for any uh, possibilities of seeing their theology prior to the Reformation. I mean, it, if you think about it, they had to because the whole premise is that we're not doing anything new here. We're just reviving what's been kind of forgotten. Right. So if if you're not finding it in the fathers, and some maybe some medieval writers, then there's got to be some red flags going up. Um, well, that said, I was falling in love with Augustine's writings more and more as I read him uh, and being convinced at that time that he was truly a proponent of what is commonly called Calvinism. And so I thought it would be you start. OK, just pause for a second. You started ahead. out. You mentioned you picked up his anti-Pelagian writings for a couple bucks. What was your next writings of his? Well, okay, so so fair question. Let me let me let me cast it this way. Um, the I wasn't done with his anti-Pelagian writings for a while because I would just be dipping in and out. But the more I read them, the more I loved them. And then at some point, I heard that his City of God was his most significant work, and that was the next work I picked up. That's so, that's uh, that's a good piece of literature. It, it it's a phenomenal i mean it, it it's the, it is truly the the work that revolutionized my christian faith and 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 gave me the bridge to the catholic faith completely but we're not there quite yet because at this moment i'm just like i'm just thinking well gosh just these anti-pelagian writings because i'm thinking if you're an arminian which by the way i had on my on the back of my car i had a uh, bumper sticker that said arminianism the other gospel and had referenced that galatians passage where if <laughs> If an angel from heaven, you know, preaches, let him be anathema. It is lit. And I had a guy pull me over to talk to me about my bumper sticker. Like, you know, he literally waved me over while I was driving and said, Hey, I want to talk about this. And I was like, okay. And we had like a good 20 minute conversation on the side of the road about Calvinism and Arminianism. It was, it was really funny. I mean, that's all my world was. I just thought Calvinism was the best thing since sliced bread. Right. And, um, and who can gainsay it? The logic is impregnable. It, it's, you can't, overturn the logic it's so fundamentally obvious reading the scriptures right so um <laughs> so i thought this would be great i can use augustine against roman catholics with my i was sharpening my teeth to start going after catholics and um with that said uh you know during this time i uh, i digested countless primary and secondary reform sources i was reading of course i di i digested calvin's commentary uh, um his institutes a you know, he had a pretty big commentary set. So, but I digested a lot of that. Uh, read uh, Francis Turton's Institutes of Electric Theology. I was reading mm. a, a lot of David Steinmetz, who was a Reformation scholar. And so it sounds of... like you were, apart from being a, 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 a credo Baptist, you were essentially James White, essentially. Well, I mean, I haven't really heard about James White at this time, but yeah, I mean, that it wasn't. It, it was my sincere belief that you don't mind. Arminian, um, what time was this? Was this was this eighties or nineties or? Okay, so this would have been uh, early, early mid nineties. So ninety, I became a Calvinist in ninety three, and uh, that lasted about five years of change. And uh, okay. and I'm going to get to how how I got out of that. But but this all this all has relevance, by the way, to our bigger topic about Augustine and 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 his uh, use in the Protestant. Catholic apologetic inter exchange. Mm. So, um, so let's hear, where was I? Um, yeah. So his anti-Pelagian writings was really the thrust of my, my apologetic talking with Catholics. If I could, um, I wasn't listening to James White until, uh, the late nineties. So I had no knowledge of who this James White was, by the way, I was listening to like Bible answer man and, um, white horse in and things like that, but no James White. Walter Sorry. Martin. Oh yeah. Well, well, this was with uh, Hank Hanegraaff. Walter Martin was like uh, late eighties, right? Mid late. Oh, yeah, because so, I think he died in eighty nine or ninety. Yeah, yeah. I liked yeah. uh, Bible Answer Man. I thought, well, you know, he's a pretty good guy. Uh, <laughs> now he's orthodox. And of course, 
he became orthodox, so it was a step up, right? <laughs> um, so where was I here? Um, oh, so I've, I've got Aquinas for my belt. I'm starting to read some Aquinas too. And by the way, at this time, uh, in the uh, I'm prepping to go to seminary. I want to, I'm teaching um, at this time Reformation theology classes. I, I've got my own publication in the mid 90s, a uh, reform publication called uh, Foundations Theological Journal, uh, a complete print thing where I had about a, a subscribership of uh, 200 plus people, Florida and Georgia. So I was I was putting my magazine out in uh, Christian bookstores and uh, just people were gobbling the stuff up. There was kind of this little mini ca uh, Calvinistic revival going on, at least in my neck of the woods. And I thought, wow, this is great. People love this stuff. Um, and what was happening was uh, the first crack in my Calvinism was when I was I was taking some classes uh, from R.C. Sproul on uh, God. And uh, I, mean, I, th I think I had three classes, one on justification. Uh, I was doing this at the seminary there at Knox Seminary, one on uh, systematic theology. And I think one on. Um, oh, gosh, I can't remember the third one. But but I remember John Owen came up and I was like, oh, let me get John Owen. You know, he's the Puritan who defended the five points that, or defended limited atonement in his book, his famous work, The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. Right. And I thought that was essential to get because I want to defend limited atonement. But the crack came when I got to Owen's section on his exegesis on Second Corinthians 514, where it says we have reached this conclusion that one died for all, therefore all died. Well, Owen flips that on his on its head and says, well, you know, the the all who died was the one who died for all of them kind of thing. I mean, just very tricky gymnastics about how to get around that obvious universal passage. I was like, oh, that's kind of strange. Right. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah, you can you can maybe take a little bit of what I know about Augustine. Take it to the bank. So there's so much. The, a, I guess the a glowing so endorsement. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. But anyway, that said, um, I, I didn't give up Calvinism. I was like, I kind of said, huh, that's kind of a funny way to defend limited atonement. I thought of better ways to do it. But it was a brilliant book otherwise. Owen is a, a brilliant writer. But what had happened was because I loved the Reformation so much, I was thinking Luther was a Calvinist. I didn't know this. I mean, all the Luther people, if anybody's out there, any Luther's listening, they're going to laugh. But I didn't know he wasn't a Calvinist. I just assumed that he was on the same page as John Calvin. And uh, so what happened in uh, the R.C. Sproul class I was taking on systematic theology, R.C. Sproul was going on about Martin Luther, and I was sitting in the front right-hand side of the class, and he looked at me square in the eyes, and he said, you know, Luther is one of us. I was like, I was like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> So what what I do? I, I started picking up all of Luther's stuff. I'm Luther, like, Augustine, Luther. Aquinas, they're yeah. all Calvinists. They're, not, they're all Calvinists, right? <laughs> and uh and so I start I, I picked up Luther's smaller catechism and I picked up his on Christian liberty. Uh I picked up uh Bondage of the Will, read that three times. Um I I I just started and I picked up his uh, his sermons. How sermons and all that. I mean, I, I couldn't get enough of Luther because I just loved the way he was writing. I loved his his colorful uh, language. <laughs> I, I loved just the whole lore that surrounded Luther. I mean, he's a very exciting character. I, I, I can't think of anybody as exciting as Luther in the Reformation era. Well, um, well, it's it's funny because James White uh, likes to say, "Well, I don't think Martin Luther was the right guy to lead the Reformation. It should have been." John Wycliffe and I'm like Wycliffe was so boring you know Martin Luther is the kind of <laughs> right. the kind of brawler you need like That's his right. writing it's it, it's really it's kind of like he wrote like, like Christopher Hitchens almost oh um, yeah no the polemics were fascinating I loved Reformation polemics I thought these guys were like this is before I read St. Jerome right I thought these guys were like the the height <laughs> of and they and honestly there was a lot of very abusive rhetoric going back and forth you know um, uh, Reformation was a very crazy time, but, um, but I, as I was reading Luther, I was like, huh, something's interesting. I'm reading his catechism and I'm seeing a very, uh, different way of approaching the sacraments, like distinct. And I knew about Lutheranism through the, the white horse end, but, but reading Luther like directly, it was like, wow, this is kind of different than the way Calvin's talking about the Lord's supper 
and baptism. And, uh, and not only that, his emphasis, the Christological emphases that Luther had, I mean, it was, it was injecting something into my reform paradigm. And, and I know what reform haters are going to say. I was like, well, you haven't really read Calvin enough. No, no, Calvin, you know, he, you know, he didn't have a, um, boring Christology, but Luther's was way more exciting. It felt Luther looking back, looked like Luther had more, something more akin to Eastern uh, Orthodox sort of Christology. It just, it just, it just seemed to uh, um, permeate everything. Calvin, his Christology, Christology didn't permeate everything. Luther made sure it was everything. And, and of course, in Lutheran theology, Christology is theology, right? That's where you start and end. And, um, and I began falling in love with it. And I remember teaching one class that I got approved to teach an adult's uh, theology class at Coral Ridge. And I was talking about baptismal regeneration because in the catechism, Luther talks about baptismal regeneration. And boy, I got a bunch of hands going up. And, and one of the elders was there too. And uh, Well, I, what, would you just pause for a second. At sure. this time, I know you had read quite a bit of Augustine. Had you not come across that in your Augustine readings? You would think I would have seen it. It was not obvious to me at the time. And by the way, again, this was mostly just his, at this time, just his anti-Pelagian writings. Now I can but tell you now about you back, regeneration in the anti-Pelagian writings. You, they're in there. And I know that, but here's the thing. When you're looking for tulip, you're almost blind to everything else. You, you know what I'm saying? It's almost like you're just, yeah, it, it, yeah. it, and, and I'm not saying I didn't, I finally figured out. I mean, I finally saw that later, but uh, at the time, this is sort of early on still, I just saw Augustine as a proponent of the five points because that's the most important thing, right? Um, but what was happening here is I'm seeing that's the gospel, Luther, right? <laughs> that's right. Well, I'm thinking because I've been conditioned to think that baptismal regeneration is heretical, right? I mean, you just because that's what the nasty Catholics believe. Forget the Orthodox. I didn't know any Shinola about them. They're not even in the radar for me. And uh, oh, I, you uh, mean you hadn't heard of the essence versus energy distinction? <laughs> no, my, my noose was not well formed at the time, but I do, I do, <laughs> I do admit, I do admit though, that, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy did play a role in my becoming Catholic, but that's a little bit later, but oh. it, yeah, it, it, I mean, it's, God is, was really good. Cause I got to see a lot of things in my journey here, but what had happened was in this, in this, uh, deep dive into Luther. And by the way, I'm reading at this time, Luther Melanchthon, I'm leading, reading Chemnitz, Phenomenal. I mean, the guy is a patristic uh, monster. I mean, anybody that's read Kimnitz knows this guy. Just, I mean, Calvin, you think Calvin's got a very intimidating sort of way of his memory is ridiculous. Calvin knows everything. He remembers everything he's read. I mean, he had to have, because when you see him quote spouting off, I mean, he sometimes misquotes, you know, places from one father to the other, whatever he transposes, but it doesn't matter. I mean, he, he just, there was a oh, legend no that he was afraid that, of that, right? So. Yeah, I mean, but there he was so learned. He knew so much. He he was just such an expert. Uh, his his section alone on the on the uh, evolution of the papacy, right, in the institutes is just it's just phenomenal. Uh, I mean, you don't agree with it, obviously, and I don't, but it's just phenomenal. It's an amazing work. But that said, I was falling in love with Luther's sacramentology. It felt like something a little more Catholic. It felt like it was reaching back prior to the Reformation, and it was starting to, you know, because I thought, well, Augustine was sort of this. Calvinisty sort of guy, but but everything else is dark after Augustine, and I'm seeing Luther as sort of the the, the light. But now Luther's saying, "Oh no, we we carry on the Catholic tradition. We are in the Augsburg, you know, Confession and 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 the um, Book of Con Concord. I mean, they're they're very clearly so saying so, so pause for a second. I I, yeah. I, I uh, um, what did you think since Augustine dies in 430 and Martin Luther isn't till 1517? At this point in your journey, what what did you think of about those eleven hundred years, where you had, well, who was the, the the top dog in that time? You know, so between Augustine and Luther. Yeah, so I, I got to thank R.C. Sproul for this. This is funny because R.C. Sproul was probably respond the single most important person in my life to help me start reading Aquinas. Because he said nothing but good things about Aquinas in his class. Yeah, that's true. He loved Aquinas. 
Yeah, even even while he was talking about justification, you know, he said, well, you know, Aquinas, you know, he misread Paul and he was, you know, turning grace into sort of a, a substance. You could almost lose it like a like water in a leaky cup. And, you know, but but um, he was often referencing Aquinas and most of the time it was very positive. And which was weird, because if you read somebody like Francis Schaeffer, big, uh, I don't know if you know who he was, but he was uh, he was. Yeah, huge uh, intellect in the 20th century. Uh, he's a guy that did the Labrie Fellowship. That's where R.C. Sproul got his uh, sort of boost from Francis Schaeffer. He was very, uh, he looked down on Aquinas, if you read his manifesto for the Christian faith. Um, it, he, 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 blame, he lays the blame at uh, for the West decay at Aquinas' feet, pretty much. Oh, wow. And- <laughs> So I, I wasn't thinking very highly of Aquinas when I was reading Schaefer, but when I was in Sproul's class, it was a very different picture, especially with his uh, emphasis on classical apologetics. Uh, he was constantly referencing Aquinas. So I actually started getting a taste for this medieval theology. So to answer your question, I started seeing another bright light in the middle of all this was Aquinas. Oh, yeah. So, so you see, you've seen Augustine and a few other guys I didn't know much about. In the middle of this, you're seeing Aquinas as this bright light, and Sproul is saying all kinds of good things. So it couldn't be half bad. And oh, by the way, and Aquinas believed in unconditional election and predestination. That very Calvinistic sort of bent on on that soteriology. Tulip. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah, naturally, I'm I'm thinking tulips there. Uh, so I start reading more. I start getting some English uh, versions of Aquinas Aquinas Summa. Right. This is good. So so the, the the blanks are starting to fill in a little bit. And so what's um, unfortunately what's happening here is I'm, I'm getting a sense that the whole story is not even in Lutheranism. As much as I read in Luther, and I, I read tons of Lutheran theology. And uh, frankly, I was a little disappointed because sometimes they they absolutely misrepresent the Reformed tradition and the Reformed guys absolutely misrepresented Lutheran tradition. And uh, well, there's even guys online. Hmm? Well, is, is is it true? I've heard this. I, I, I don't have a primary source on this, but I've heard this, mm-hmm. that toward the end of his life, uh, M- Martin Luther, like, repudiated St. Augustine. Like, he just, threw, like, very late in his life, last couple of years. Is, it, is that true or not? Well, I haven't read anything that would validate that rumor. Okay. I, I, I've not heard or... I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, because L- Luther, it's funny because as much as he'll appeal to tradition, Eric Ibarra and I were talking about this a couple year ago or so, you know, when um, Luther was at the, uh, was debating Zwingli, right? On, on the, on the Eucharist, you know, Zwingli it, it, and Luther's like, you're, you're not, you're not going with the church fathers here. You know, we're, we're on the side of <laughs> tradition about Christ's real presence and of course, Zwingli's like, "What do you mean? You're you're the guy that's like, I don't care if all the fathers are against me. I I just I can breathe one word from Scripture and it kills them all." You know, and it's like, so so Luther, so it's funny. This this is sort of this sort of the split personality of of these uh, more I guess higher Reformation traditions. They they pay a lot of lip service or they tip the hat to the fathers, but at the end of the day, sola scriptura scriptura really does collapse to. Uh, whatever my local church is doing or whatever I'm doing. I mean, it's, it, you, you can, you know, if you were in Geneva and Calvin's Geneva and you, you said, I don't believe in infant baptism, but I believe everything else. I mean, you'd be dragged before the consistory. You wouldn't, Calvin wouldn't tolerate some guy that denied infant baptism. He would, he, he, in the institutes, he says it's satanic to deny infant baptism. He calls that a satanic. Doctrine. James White, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, but well, they were just wrong. And that, you know, it, it, but see here, this was the whole thing. It was a, uh, I felt like it was sort of the split personality disorder. Like, okay, here's my family. But then I'm, I'm learning as more I'm reading these sources that, wow, I'm having less and less in common with them. Like now I'm starting to see baptismal regeneration by this time. And, and of course, Luther obviously believed in it. Um, Luther also believed you could lose your salvation, right? And, and this was all new. And I was like, how does that work with sola fide, justification by faith alone? So I had to start dealing with all these categories, like, wow, the Reformation wasn't as sort of monolithic as I was hoping. Romantic was as, hoping. As, as it was. Yeah, you, sure, you, you you come to find these things out over time, but but the reality was, it's like, man, I'm, I'm falling in love with this medieval guy named Aquinas, 
And it, it's looking like other than predestination and election, he's not really sharing much with this reformation. You know, <laughs> um, I know some people try to squeeze sola fide out of him. I get, I mean, in sola scriptura, but don't you, Aquinas don't you was know that everyone taught sola fide, you know, up until. <laughs> well, you, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the cat, the Catholics on, on Twitter space need to be careful because when they say, well, you'll never find a church father talking about sola fide. I mean, you can, you can do a search. You'll find the words faith alone many times. Um, but it has nothing to do with what's going on in the Reformation. Um, yeah, that's how you do research, to do like a word search. That, well, that's right. You just do a word search. But but the reality is, is uh, this is how Catholics get in trouble, right? And, and, and this is, and honestly, I think the Reformers were playing on the ignorance of the population because nobody was reading the Church Fathers. No laity were. Um, and if, if I recall, there was sort of an embarrassment that Melanchthon had toward Augustine. Because when they're looking at justification in Augustine, and I'm starting to see all this, is that he's not talking about sola fide, imputed righteousness. That's not something in Augustine's radar. He's thinking uh, it's nothing more than renewal, you know, the, the Holy Spirit being given. Uh, you get your forgiveness of sins, and God infuses you with the Spirit and with love. <laughs> so that's, for, that's what justification is for Augustine, not imputed righteousness. So... Um, yeah, it's, be, it's becoming more and more disappointing that as much as the Lutherans were talking a big game about being with the fathers, it, it was becoming evident that, wow, something is not adding up, right? As I'm progressing in my studies and readings of the Reformation and some medieval theology, by this time I'm looking into Lombard, right? Because the sentences was all over the place and, the, and you know, it was the most um, read commentary in the Middle Ages. Yeah, um, like I think I'm, in the... Middle Ages, you had you had the Summa and you had the Sentences. Those were the yeah. two big, very important medieval stuff. theological documents. That's right, and I'm picking up Anselm too. So, and I'm I'm hearing about Anselm through these Reformation debates on on limited atonement. And I remember listening to this debate between Calvinists and Catholics back in the early '90s about was did Anselm get it right? You know, and I'm thinking, who's Anselm? And I'm picking up his stuff. It's like, wow, this guy's great. Other than him, and, and I find out, like, yeah, he talks about predestination there, but at this point, I'm starting to get bored with predestination, not because I don't believe in it. And to this day, I still believe in unconditional election. People always ask me, like, you know, you know, have you abandoned Calvinism? Yes, I'm just an Augustinian now in the purest sense, but I still believe in unconditional election. <laughs> That's the only thing I brought with me from my early days. Um, but that said, Anselm was brilliant. And uh, all I'm seeing over and over as I'm reading these people is just they're just Catholics. Like they're Catholic, um, I'm their their sacramentology, their the way they're talking about the church. It's not exactly how we're talking about it in Lutheranism. So in Lutheranism, you can be you can be like three lay people, right? If you're all baptized and you want to start a church, the other people can just if there's no other way of be becoming a church, they can just appoint you as the the pastor and you start a new church, right? This is their theology of their, their ecclesiology because as much as it would be ideal to be sent by existing uh, ministers, you as a sort of this whole uh, priest of all believers thing, we have it in us to, to step up and start a church, right? And this is, and Calvin says as much, by the way, we're gonna get to this in a minute, his theology of, of the church, um, even though he has a low view of the Anabaptists who think that they can just start churches themselves, he essentially admits this is a possibility. But um, let me let me go back to my outline here because I feel like I'm veering so much here. Uh, so. So Luther's sacramentology, I felt like he was a lot more Catholic. Um, I started feeling this, this tension in the Reformation. I was like, wow, this isn't so monolithic. I started yearning for a Protestantism that was more palpably linked to the church prior to the 16th century. Because Wait, I was uh, just pause for a sec. Were you, sure. like, at this point, had you read any of the early Reformers apart from Luther and Calvin, like mm -hmm. Zwingli or Tyndale or who else? Yeah, Vermigli, Bootser. Uh, I mean, like I said, I was reading a lot of David Steinmetz and he was introducing me to all those like lesser Reformation lights. I mean, very, you know, important people in that whole magisterial context. Yeah, I started reading, uh, you know, all the various um, formulas uh, and creeds. Um, like every every region had like, you know, you had the Scots confession, the Helvetic confession. I mean, you had all these confessions. Those were exciting me because they were all saying pretty much a lot of the same things. But what's funny is I was starting, I noticed some weird things like in the Scots confession, you had baptismal regeneration explicitly affirmed in that reformed mm -hmm. context. 
And I was like, well, that's kind of weird, but I let it slide because yeah, <laughs> at that time I wasn't convinced. But by the time I became Lutheran, I was like, yeah, there's no way you can read anybody prior to the 16th century and come away with this whole, you know, it's just a symbol of my, my obedience. Um, I, I joined the LCMS in 98, I'd say around there, 97, 98. And, um, and I was like, good, I'm home. I can start thinking about seminary again. I'm going to go to Fort Wayne, Indiana, go to Concordia. I just wanted to get on the road, right? I just want to start doing ministry. But they were dumb enough to let me teach um, uh, Lutheran theology for their adult class. <laughs> I say dumb enough because I feel like, you know, how, how low do you have to go to get me to teach it? But it was <laughs> it was fun and and it and it just turned out wow nobody there was reading Luther like nobody was really in touch with their Lutheran roots. There's like one or two other than the minister and the vicar and a couple people. They they were basically evangelicals that they they're almost. Uh, it was it was a very low church LCMS. I know they had some higher church ones, but um, uh, it was just strange because I felt like I was just talking to evangelicals prior to my Lutheranism. Um, but I think that's true for a lot of places you go to. You can find people that don't know a lot about their own tradition or faith. But that said, what was interesting, now this is where we're getting closer to the sort of the payoff here. I was talking to the to the vicar at, at the LCMS church, and he we were talking about C.S. Lewis. That was one of his favorite authors. I knew Lewis. I read his Mere Christianity, whatever. And he mentioned something about the, uh, the uh, Oxford movement, the Anglo-Catholics. And I was like, what, what's an Anglo-Catholic, right? I mean, not that Lewis was an Anglo-Catholic, but we got into that and he said, oh, yeah, they're just like, uh, you know, Anglicans with this sort of medieval bent, you know, this Catholic bent and whatnot. And I was like, oh, OK. So what's funny is this road that I the street I drove down like 100 times where I was living in South Florida had an actually an ACC church, an Anglo an Anglican Catholic church right there on, on that street. I never noticed it. That's before. a fairly uh like that that's like a very high church version of anglicanism but at the same time it's very uh, small it's a very small body right well so so anglo catholicism i mean that was really the thing that when you read the history of it, i mean that's what i think in a way saved anglicanism in the in the late 19th early 20th century but but it, i mean it had a very amazing evangelistic outreach it, it did so many good things and it had a, quite a reach in 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 England, there was a lot of fighting about it, but but from my point of view, I didn't know. I just thought it was it was Anglicanism. I didn't know there was because um, I, I remember I was in France. I was going to an Anglican church, but this sounded different, right? I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So there's like a this Catholic sort of thing going on, but they're Protestant, you know. I that's that's the way I was thinking about it. But when I forgot about that conversation, I was driving down the street and I saw this sign that said Anglican uh, Catholic faith, Anglican worship, or something on it. It said St. Augustine of Canterbury, and it had the sign. And I was like, Anglican faith, Catholic worship, or, or I forgot how it goes with the thing. But I was like, oh, that's interesting. That sounds like what we were talking about a few weeks ago. And so I was like, I was interested. So I visited, I, you know, I missed Sunday at the LCMS church, and I visited this place. And uh, and boy, I'll tell you, I walked in this. It felt like I was going into a, a time machine. I mean, it was, it felt thoroughly medieval. Like uh, it, it was like something that you would have been seeing in, in I don't know, 1498. I don't know. It's, I just had no I had nothing to compare it to because when I was in France, it was all low church. It was very evangelical. They had the liturgy, but it was nothing like this. This felt to me like if you could identify something as papist and, and Romish, this would have been it. But I wasn't so scared. I was more intrigued than anything. And I felt absolutely in love with us. Like, wait a minute. This has all the feeling of pre-Reformation liturgy but they have some attachment to to protestant theology that's how i was thinking of it at the time and uh and i was in love and so uh i was in the lcms maybe two years if that um interestingly enough that 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 experience at the anglican church turned my world upside down because now all bets were off now it's like the reformation isn't so neat because i'm hearing from these guys that yeah uh, you know time of king henry he had a very catholic prayer book, you know, things like that, you know, you had the King's prayer book and it was still very, uh, what did you know, this church people. think about Martin Luther and John Calvin? The, the, oh, well, Anglican. so in Anglo, <laughs> so it depends on the angle, but in Anglo-Catholic circles, generally they're looked down upon 
But I got an interesting story about that because I thought, like, I didn't know at this time that that they were hated. You know, I, I didn't have a category yet for what I was looking and experiencing here. But uh, but I was starting to go. They were they they you know if, if you know anything about Anglo Catholicism, I mean, uh, at least in the ACC, they use the the People's Missile, which is essentially, and I and I and I oversimplify this, but it's basically uh, the Latin Mass peppered with uh, you know sort of structured around the Book of Common Prayer. And so everything in in our experience with, and by the way, it's it's the most beautiful English mass you can be a part of. Um, it's essentially the Latin mass, and this is why I had no problem becoming a a, a traditional Latin a traditional Latin mass Catholic because to me it was just simply doing the same thing. So so I'm curious, like like I've been to an Anglican ordinary at mass. Actually, there's one mm -hmm. super close to my house. Yep. is that pretty much the thing they had? Yeah, it's very it's very close. The ordinary at mass has some, uh, of course, corrections and some uh, additions and changes. Um, it, it's it's not it's not exactly a, a carbon copy, but it's close enough. So if you were okay. an Anglo Catholic, you'll you'll feel very comfortable at an ordinary ordinary at mass as it was designed to be. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's virtually the same thing. So that's what I was experiencing. And of course I'm, I'm reading about the ACC and, and there, there's this thing called the, the, the St. Louis conference in 1977, where it's basically all to fight against the tide of liberalism and women's ordination, you know, all these Anglican uh, uh, denominations or bishops got together and they said, look, this is what, what our belief is. And they, they listed the seven ecumenical councils, right? The seven, I mean, I didn't really know much about ecumenical council. I know Calvin talked about them in the institutes, but this is the first time I saw it as being having priority, having priority over the prayer book. So really, so they affirmed a set of an ecumenical councils. That's right. Uh, look, at at the to. look at the affirmation of St. Louis. All, all the Anglo-Catholic bodies uh, that got together said we must throw our roots into the first seven ecumenical councils because for them, that's the undivided church of the first thousand years. And that's oh, safe. Man, they ahead. must be easy to debate then. <laughs> Because, I mean, because Pope Agatha's letter, which is accepted fully at the council, applies yeah. Matthew 16, Luke 22, and John 21 to the papal office. But You know, and I 100% agree, but nobody's talking about the Pope. <laughs> you know, I mean, in those circles, yeah, you're, they're probably really easy to debate. And, uh, you know, I'll, we can get into how that started looking when I was actually in seminary. I didn't get there yet, but I was actually in seminary uh, when I became a Catholic. I was training to become an Anglican priest, but... Uh, but here we go. I'm, I'm starting off fresh again saying, wow, this is amazing because now the, the way it was looking is that you had at your, at your disposal, everything from the church fathers to up to the reformation, anybody pretty much now it seemed like Anglicanism, which to me, the genius is that it has multiple identity crises here. It's like, it, it, it the problem is, is it's so broad. And well, if you want to be the, Hmm. Well, because I don't know if you've seen uh, Jordan Cooper's uh, critique of Anglicanism. Have you seen that? No, no, I haven't. He essentially says on a wide range of subjects and like important subjects, like mm -hmm. the Eucharist and, and things like that. Like for like, for example, for the U U Eucharist, you can go from a piece of bread all the way up to like just below transubstantiation. Right. So, so like there's. I, and and everything in between. There's a huge range. Oh. It's not like I'll do you one better. Our, our Metropolitan affirmed transubstantiation. If you look in his uh, manual of Anglican faith and practice, he affirms not only transubstantiation, he affirms ex opera operato. <laughs> so it's wow. it's crazy, Bill. Well, so yeah. did Saint Augustine, though. So yeah. Well, I mean, from an Anglican point of view, that's very <laughs> not that'd be very. Nobody in the 16th century is going to accept you as an Anglican minister saying those things, you know, but yeah. that's where Anglo Catholicism finally went. It, it, it became, and that's my point is it became so broad. And, uh, but I didn't know this. I thought, wow. Okay. So I kind of see there's like a low church, high church version, but you know, they're, you know, they, they have sort of a lower view of things, but they're still brothers and sisters. They're in the same body, whatever, whatever, but what, which was weird, but we weren't communing with most Anglican bodies. The ACC can only commune with those churches that, affirmed the St. Louis affirmation, but even then there was no communist in Socrates. There was, there was, so, you know, so who like, affirmed the St. Louis affirmation? Like does ACNA, does the, the REC? 
Yeah, the uh, yeah. So I the REC uh, they kind of, they're kind of like uh, late comers to the Anglo Catholic impulse. They they used to be like hardcore Calvinists, right? But nowadays REC runs the gamut. Uh, I, I met REC guys are very uh, um, affirming of the Anglo Catholic Catholic worldview and ethos and stuff. I mean, the REC used to be hardcore thirty nine articles, right? But if you're in the ACC as well as some other uh, high church Anglo Catholic conservative denominations, they sub they subordinate the, the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 articles to the seven ecumenical councils. And what they what they'll say is the prayer book is of course our structure, you know, prayer life, but the articles, they're more interesting historically and they don't serve as a normative uh way of informing us for theology. Which which uh people in the classical high church tradition, and I, I know if if uh, the other Paul hears us, he'll be pulling his hair out because he's like, no, that's not how it was. In the classical world, you would be shot before you were a papist, and he would be absolutely right. Uh, high, classical high church Anglicanism had nothing to do with what you're seeing in Anglo Catholicism. That was a hard right turn off the road somewhere. Um, but that's that's really the kind of Anglicanism that that uh, got popular in the early 20th century. And um, you had oh, what's his name, Ramsey, who was um, the Archbishop back in the 90s he was an anglo-catholic so so anglicanism can coexist with all kinds of weird stuff right you could be super conservative and you have to commune with a bishop that believes in women's ordination and is ordaining women right except for uh in the acc you don't do that you just you commune with a few people but but if you're in the episcopal church or in the church of england you could say i don't like it but you are in communion with these bishops right so this, but this was the world I was in. I thought, well, at least I can be very conservative. I can read my Reformation. I can read my church fathers. And this is when the tide of church fathers started coming in. Because Anglo-Catholicism, as you know, is, is I mean, Anglicanism, some of the most brilliant uh, church, uh, patri patristic scholars are, are from the Anglican tradition. Uh, yeah, like I will, Lightfoot or... Bar none. I mean, they, they produce, God has somehow given the world the most brilliant, Patristic scholars in that tradition, Chaff, <laughs> and I don't care who you well, are. Well, they're just was reform, but huh? Well, well, sh like, like yeah, like I got the Shaft set up there, which is uh, I, I don't know if Shaft was Anglican, but that's the same. No, no, he was reformed. He was German reformed. Yeah, like it seems like that's like an Anglican uh, set, though. Like, it, like the commentaries of Anglican bent, and there's a lot of scholars who were involved in that, but uh, yeah. So, so all this to say, and I know Augustine's kind of faded in our in our conversation. I want to keep going here. I want to press ahead. I, I just wanted to say though that I was an Anglican for seventeen years, right? And 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 so during this time, um, I just sort of camped out. I was very comfortable. Being Anglican is the most comfortable thing in the world, bar none. It is. I can understand why there's a draw to it because not only did it seem true, but it's like an old comfortable pair of shoes. It, it's just. It's like you can almost you can almost run for cover anywhere and be safe. You can build a bubble around yourself. You can be like, oh, all those stupid Anglicans over there, they don't perturb me at all, you know. Um, and plus, you feel like you've got your arms around everything. Um, so, you know, when you're reading C.S. Lewis or reading John Cable or, or Pusey, it, it didn't matter. You felt like you were in touch with the entire Christian tradition in some form or fashion. So I've always told people, I was like, you know, in an alternate universe, you know, what Protestant would you want to be? I, uh, hands down, be Anglican every day, any day, because it's well, the only sort of Protestantism that actually makes sense to me. That's crazy. Well, it is, there, there's the, um, like, the thing that Protestants like to say, and it kind of makes me laugh when people like James White and mm -hmm. Gavin Ortland saying, well, look, Protestants <laughs> respect the tradition, but mm -hmm. we just support... <laughs> It's like we respect the tradition, but we subordinate any it, it all to scripture in the end and stuff. You know, we're just trying to dust off the accretions that have come over centuries. And yeah. like for someone like James sure. White or, or or Gavin Ortland to say that, it's like no, you don't. You know, but I think an Anglican can, can at least make an argument for that. <clears throat> They, they they can at least present that case. It's like, yes, we are respecting that tradition, but we're trying to dust off some accretions. Yeah, I, think an I mean, look, that 
I, I agree. And, and look, that's the funny thing. Anglicanism, I mean, it, it's, I think that's why the ordinary it, um, is as successful as, I mean, I think it could be a lot more successful, but um, clearly um, Anglicanism is in touch in a meaningful way with the patristic sources. And that's why you have the Oxford guys. They're at least trying to deal with their Reformation prayer book and articles and trying to find a way. And of course, the famous track 90 with John Newman on how to sort of read the prayer book in its most Catholic sense, read the articles in their most most Catholic sense. Um, you know, I felt that because because to me, it made sense like we don't want to cut ourselves off. Right. And, and Calvin, when you read the Institutes, I mean, he'll use language like, oh, we're the Catholic Church. We're part of the Catholic Church. We're we're in that. Right. We you know, and Calvin had a very high ecclesiology. I mean, he didn't, you know, you, you, you'll find a lot of Christians today, a lot of evangelicals or cows, you know, uh, say, say, well, if I don't make it to church, it's fine. It's fine. You know, I'll, I'll miss a Sunday or two. If you miss like two or three Sundays in Geneva, you, you know, you, you'll be disciplined. If you weren't going, you'll be taken off the rolls. And for Calvin, you're, you removed from, from membership. That's a way of saying you're, you know, that's a bad sign. You're not among the elect. You're probably damned. John <laughs> so, Calvin has condemned you. Yeah, yeah, oh, no. but but the reality is, is they they had a lot higher view. There was no such thing as skipping church on Sunday. At least you know for Calvin, the local church was the expression of uh, of the assembly of the believers, and if you weren't there, you were disobeying God. So I mean, you know that said, he still in his prefatory address, and we're giving back to Calvin now. He was saying things like, "Look uh, to King Francis. Look if we if 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 you think that you need to have bishops all time and structure." The structure all the time, this visible structure, that's a that's a vanity. Uh, the church can basically disappear. I mean, he, he says as much. Um, and I, I got the quote here, man. I got I got to read it to you. But essentially, he affirms that the church doesn't have to be tangible for it to exist. I mean, you may have few people here and there, but the institution doesn't have to remain. Because if you're unfaithful to the gospel, if you're unfaithful to the doctrine, well, that's the true core of apostolic succession. That's You, that's you know something. You know something, though? John Calvin can only make that because you had 1,500 years of institution. That's right. Prior to propping it up. So if John Calvin says that in 1535 or whatnot, uh, yeah, that's only because you had a solid foundation. Like, if you did that in the second century, you would have disappeared into oblivion. Like, because I think Calvin thought, I could be wrong on this, but... I think Calvin thought that Ignatius's, like like Saint Ignatius of Antioch, that all of his epistles were forgeries, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah. yeah so, I, I, I mean, like, because back then, early in the second century, you had the structure. Like he he lays it out. You got the bishop, you got the the pres. Presbyteroi and the mm -hmm. the deacons, and mm -hmm. don't do anything without the bishop. But that's that's right. a reason I can't go to the SXPX because I'm like, Look, right. I'm an apologist. I quote Ignatius all the time. How can I quote this guy if right. he says you can't do anything religiously that's not approved by the bishop? So that's right. so like the, and 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 so so that so 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 Calvin. The only way he could say that is because he was standing on 1,500 years of a solid structure. Where he's like, oh, you don't need the structure. Well, you know, that's kind of cute, but mm -hmm. there's no way you could say this back then and certainly yeah. not survived, you know. And it's telling that he doesn't really use the fathers at that point to argue his case. I mean, I think he pulls one quote from Augustine, which doesn't really support it. But uh, most other times, he'll he'll be happy to use Augustine to, to show that, well, this is what we really, you know, he really believes what we're believing here. But when it came to that, he wasn't using the fathers. He was saying, basically, his argument was, stick with me. I got this really good syllogism as to why you don't have to have the, the, the visible church. <laughs> Alan Rules is woke on the SSPX question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I, well, I love well, the well, SSPX. Well, like, I'm not like a super anti-SSPX. I'm, I'm not Like, either. I do understand. Yeah, like, I, I'm kind of neutral toward them. Because I do understand we're in a very desperate time. But in yes. at the same time, I think... If your bishop is supplying for you a, a regular Latin mass, I don't think you have a reason to go SXBX. Like, if he's not 
giving you the lat mass. I, I'm, I'm kind of iffy. Maybe you can, can make a case that you could go. But but like for me, I got a fraternity of St. Peter Church, full-time priest, uh, full-time two priests. So, I mean, I like, you, you know, I, 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 I can't, well, yeah, I, I'm just trying to say I'm not like M Michael Forrest. In fact, if if you want, I had Kennedy Hall uh, f a few months back on my channel talking about the SXPX. Um, I I lay out both sides of the argument there. He lays out his arguments. So yeah, if you want, go watch that. Sorry, I. Uh, no, that's okay. No, this is a conversation. So. Let, let me just tell you where, where it became interesting. Remember I told you, you know, probably 23 minutes ago that I picked up uh, City of God? Well, I was reading that in my near the end of my Presbyterian years, and I was noticing some funny stuff in Augustine. Like, it wasn't like this is typical Protestant stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of funny business going on in City of God. And, uh, and I... Uh, it started becoming obvious to me that we're not dealing with the same thing. And what, what I've come to find out, like during my Protestant years, there, there was like 15, 20 things that became obvious. And I saw it in, in Anglicanism more than anything. I was now reading actively Augustine. I'm just going to go through some things because this is, this to me was a deal breaker for Protestantism because if Augustine, if, a, <laughs> if Augustine is not this, hero for the protestant movement right if all you're using augustine for is his doctrine of predestination well that you might as well not be protestant because you could be a good catholic and believe in that i don't need protestantism to do that so what i found mm -hmm. out was this and i'm just gonna go down some quick things real quick so one thing i found yeah, out no. was that uh augustine he believed that a regenerate justified man could forfeit his salvation that was a atom bomb i knew that after i became a lutheran and i started seeing like oh and his admonition uh uh, and Grace uh, book, he says, some sons of perdition begin to live in the faith, which works through charity, and so for a time live well and faithfully, and afterwards fall, and are not taken from this life before this happens to them, meaning they go to perdition. Right? <laughs> so how can you uh, have have uh, faith and charity, which are supernatural gifts of regeneration? And um, and and he says, says elsewhere that you're justified and you're regenerate in other parts. Uh but then you fall away and you don't have perseverance. So clearly Augustine just blows away the whole uh, uh, perseverance of the saints paradigm of John Calvin, who, by the way, just says, if you're regenerate, you are the elect, right? Well, well, uh, it, it, it's kind of like a, a, a verse I like to use against Calvinists, and I've never heard a good answer, is Galatians 5, 4, which says mm -hmm. you could be severed from Christ and fallen from grace. Well, if you, you were with Christ, and had grace mm -hmm. and you fell from it. Yep. Like, what does that do for perseverance of the saints? And they're like, it, well, it, it's the <laughs> grace they thought they had, but they actually didn't have. And then you get on into this massive cope. It, it, yeah. It, it's a, it's a terrible cope. And it's funny. There's a table talk legend that I remember reading about that Luther uh, while, while doing his table talk, he had his students around him. They'd be writing notes and stuff. Somebody came up to Luther and said, look, some people are preaching that, you know, once you regenerate, you can never lose your salvation. <laughs> and even Luther was like, uh, yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense. That's never been taught since the beginning of the church. So he was like, I mean, I don't know what Luther knew of Calvin specifically. Oops. Oops. But clearly it, it was a novelty. Right. So that was a big that was a big. Uh, OK, that's yeah, we can forget the reform on that count. So and here's another thing I found out. Augustine said almsgiving atoned for sin. Right, almsgiving. Yeah. Now, if well, you recount it, it says that in First Peter, that, well, that that charity covers a multitude of sin, yeah. but of course, uh, of course, and, and, and Sirach and and Proverbs. But it's funny when you read Calvin. This is what Calvin says. I'm going to read what Augustine says. Calvin says, "Well, in the Fathers, when you read, let me let me find that quote. Oh, by satisfaction, this is Calvin from the Institutes. They, for the most part, meant not compensation to be paid to God." But the public testimony by which those who had been punished with excommunication and which again to be received in communicate into communion assured the church of the repentance, right? So it's basically you're giving satisfaction to the church and not God, is literally what Calvin says. But when you read Augustine, that might be there in the fathers, but what Augustine says, he says, Do alms, redeem your sins, let the poor rejoice 
of your bounty that you may also rejoice in the grace of God. He also says, beware, we must beware, however, lest anyone think that unspeakable crimes such as those commit who will not possess the kingdom of God are daily to be perpetrated and daily to be redeemed by almsgiving. Our life must be changed for the better and alms must be used in propitiating God for past sins, not the church, not making satisfaction of the church, to God, not for somehow now, buying me. a license. Huh? Oh, oh, well, no, continue the quote. Yep, yep. So he says, not for somehow buying a license to commit these same sins with impunity. The point is, that's on, his, on faith, hope, and charity, uh, ch chapter 19. So, and then, of course, he says, again, there are then many kinds of alms by, uh, by vying of which we aid the forgiveness of our own sins. This is Augustine. That you would sounds, be kicked out of Geneva if you were saying this. Th that sounds like uh, Trent. It sounds like Romanism. Whoa. <laughs> it's famous. It's a <laughs> it's. It's, but if you're reading this, so, so what the cope is, and I've, I've heard enough, you know, I, I, I like people like Gavin Ortland. I like listening to Cooper. I mean, I'll, I'll listen to these guys. Right. But uh, the most you can do is just say, well, Augustine got it wrong. Right. Cause what you're doing ultimately with the soul of scriptura is you're just peeking over the fence to see if it validates what you already think about the scriptures. They're not looking over the fence to find out, should we correct what we think we know? They're just, you know, when we say, oh, we respect the councils, they don't respect councils and traditions. They use it as a way of saying we're legitimate, but where where we find them in er an error, we just we just dissent. But that's that's essentially the Protestant view of things. You just dissent until what's left is what you agree with. I think I chased Alan off. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Well, <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> that people like Gavin Ortland or, or Cooper have actually yeah. read, like, for example, that I just grabbed it. This is the entire Acts and the appropriate documents for Constantinople 553. Do you mm -hmm. think that they go through this to learn what it teaches? I mean, like, that's something like. Like, I don't think that they can honestly claim they have. I mean, I don't think James White can claim that, that he's actually gone through the entire, like, this almost 700 pages, all to do with the council. Mm -hmm. Can can James White claim that? I don't think Jimmy White can claim that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, his, his usefulness as an apologist, I mean, it. it of course, I, I listened for years online, you know, debating Roman Catholics. It was funny because I, I I found it to be just meh. I mean, it, even when I was still a Protestant, I found it to be, eh, it's okay. Because I thought Catholics had pretty good answers and Protestants had pretty good answers. But, but Augustine going on, I found also that he preached apostolic succession. I mean, there, there's too much here to quote, oh, yeah. but you get it from a few places. He lists a whole line of, of, of the Roman uh, bishops. Polity, of bishops. Um, Baptismal regeneration, which we already know. Uh, got, I mean, anybody that questions he taught it is just not paying attention. I mean, I don't even have to. I don't even have to qu quote the quotes here. Everybody knows Augustine taught baptismal regeneration. I didn't for a time, but when I found out, I was like, oh, okay, that's sort of like what everybody believed. It's funny. This is funny because they're in his confessions. You you remember the guy Victorinus? Augustine talks about him in 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 his confessions. So he he's the guy that wrote that book, uh, the commentary on Galatians, which in it all through, I mean, numerous places he talks about being justified by faith alone, faith alone, faith alone. I don't believe that has anything to do with what's going on in um, in in in, in uh, Geneva or or in Wittenberg. But but the reality is, is Augustine relates a message about a, a story about this Victorinus who was well known as a uh, philosopher, and uh, he read himself into the faith. He was he was he was a celebrity philosopher. He was a very learned guy. He picked up scriptures and basically read himself into the faith. And uh, the story goes, I guess Augustine relates it, is that um, uh, he was having a conversation with Simplicianus, the bishop at the time that, that he was closest to, and he asked him like, you know, when are you going to come into the church? He's like, I don't need to come to the church. I'm, I believe in God. I'm saved. I don't need anything else. I, he basically literally said, I, you, you don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to have walls to be a Christian, essentially. You don't have to be in wall. And so Simplicianus uh, gave him the right act, right? He said, oh, no, you need to, you need to stop this funny business because he knew he was afraid once he started making his public declaration that he is officially a Catholic. All bets are off. He, you know, he won't have his fame anymore. 
but so basically the way Augustine relates it is that um, he says, let us go to the church. That's what uh, Victor Rhinus says. Finally, after giving away, he says, I wish to be made a Christian. And but he not containing himself for joy accompanied him. And having been admitted to the first sacraments of instruction, he not long after gave in his name that he might be regenerated by baptism. So then that interesting here, Victor Rhinus already believed the gospel. He already said the prayer, sinner's prayer, you know, let's put it in modern terms. He gave his heart to Jesus, but he knew, and th this is how the ancients were talking about, it, you're not regenerate until you hit that water. See, it, it was it, mm. it, the whole idea, I'm just going to pray the prayer and I'm now born again. That that wasn't how they were thinking back then. So. Well, it's not how they were thinking until pretty much the 16th century. And even then, that's more of like a, a mo well, I don't know, like the, some of the stuff you've told me about calvin you know it's uh um so so that's interesting i've got some some questions for you uh do, do you mind taking them or if, sure, if, sure. if you got a bit more no i of, i'm here as long as you want me here oh, okay. i got i got i got like uh 17 things more i'm not gonna go through them all but there's tons of things that showing augustus was catholic i mean the, well, the distinction maybe, between mortal and venial sins Maybe we could do another show on that. If if you're up to it, if the uh, audience isn't bored to death, <laughs> they're not yeah, clawing their eyes out. Well, well, because well, I like this. Like it, you, you told your story and the role mm -hmm. Augustine played in it, and you kind of got our feet wet on a few issues. Right. Um. I, I, I'm thinking this is probably w w worth its own show. Like if you're w willing I'm to come back, I, I, right. I mean, I love chatting with you. So to me, this is just a fellowship. So yeah, absolutely. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, what advice w would you give to someone who say 25 ye years old in your shoes back in the day, you know, you got your Calvin and Luther and you've got your Augustine, but you've got your, your Calvinist lenses when reading him and, and all that stuff. What would you say to that person? Yeah, that's hard. I'll tell you what a Presbyterian elder told me. And I, this is some really sage advice that I got from him. He was in the OPC. Um, Cause he knew I had a penchant for reading a lot of reformation stuff, especially Calvin. And he said, you know, don't be a man of one book, read deeply and read broadly. This, this is, you know, he was an OPC elder, very learned, one of the, one of the coolest guys I ever met and, um, and his bookshelf had all kinds of stuff. And I was very, uh, I, I would say the same thing. Don't be shackled by just reading the institutes or reading uh, Lorraine Bettner or Benjamin Warfield, get out of your reform bubble. You have to. And I would say this to Catholics too. I, I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting that you need to camp out in heretical books, but you got to get out of your, you know, your 100 year history of authors. There's so much. And it's a kind of sad because a lot of Catholics don't read the patristics. I, 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 I did not know this coming into the Catholic church. I figured everybody would be loving the fathers. Right. And I know the Catholics will say we love the fathers, but um, they'll know more about 19th, 20th century mystics and saints, but they won't, you know, they'll Fatima. know more about Fatima than they'll know about Jerome or Augustine. And well, from, yeah, no, I, hmm. That's true. My experience of the church fathers is the vast majority of Catholics and mm -hmm. Protestants and Orthodox mm -hmm. have yeah. not read the fathers. They're all agreed highly of them, but they have. And like, look, I'll be honest. I haven't like I have read all the early ecclesiastical histories sure. and, and all that. But like Eusebius, sure. Theodoret, Evagrius, Sozomen, Socrates, like all mm -hmm. that stuff. But there's a lot more stuff I could read. Like I would consider myself underread. Like you, Me too. you've got someone like William Albrecht, who's like yeah. the king of the church fathers, but most people, Catholics, Protestant, Orthodox have not read the fathers. They'll speak highly. Well, of them. Like, Oh, these are the early Christians. Right. But the vast yeah. majority have not read them. Um, the first church father I read actually was St. Augustine. I, um, back in 20, like 10 or something, uh, I cracked open his, his confessions. That's a very easy read. 
Uh, it's mm-hmm. like his personal journey. Uh, he connects himself with like St. Ambrose. He talks highly about him. But um, um, yeah, no, he, he um, but, but like, and that kind of got me and I kind of read about seven books of St. Augustine. I didn't finish City of God because yeah. at, at that time, because, because it was a very advanced book. That's an advanced book. Yeah, that's dense. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of like Anna Comnene's Alexiad. I didn't finish that the first time either. Um, but, um, but like, apart from that, like, I didn't read much church. Fo- like, look, we got to read the scripture, right? But like, Absolutely. The, the, that's easy. The, the scripture is available everywhere. I got the scripture. It's on my desk right there. So, right. so like w- w- we read that and i think trad catholics l- latin mass catholics are pretty good at reading scripture m- most of the time like i think the average trad can, can can go to war with a protestant on that but like like i don't think they read the church fathers specifically augustine in 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 this case it's kind yeah, of I mean, like it's, it's- uh, notion i mean you got so many fathers and i don't mean that you have to read them all i just mean get out of your bubble and and just get some perspective on the church like pick up conf- like confessions that's an amazing yeah. devotional great way to start and 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 you can see how thirsty you know these fathers they were bible men i mean that that's another thing that was very liberating is like i didn't need the reformers because these fathers were men of the scriptures as traditional as they would be they still uh, loved the Bible. And I think, you know, Catholics, you know, we, we ought to be thirsty for scripture. If we're not, I think that says something. I'm not saying we have to be Bible scholars. I just mean that there should be some hunger to, to, to want God's word. But, um, but that said, you know, break out of their bubble. Um, obviously if there's a guy that's, uh, he's a Protestant, he's looking into the fathers. Obviously I know what the, the, the objection will be like, well, the fathers, they, and Calvin says this, they contradict. And he goes through in his prefatory address, saying one father says this, one father says that. Then, you know, it's sort of like, OK, but you can't overplay that hand too much, because while you do have fathers that speak differently on some subjects, what they have in common is still fundamentally against Protestantism. And I'm going to say that again. What they have in common is fundamentally against Protestantism, not uh, not sort of apathetic to it, not sort of neutral. It is. It, it, it goes against the very grain of the Protestant paradigm. And uh, I think that's, we have to ask ourselves, would God, the Holy Spirit, allow the church just to sink, even in the, quote, pure age, according to Calvin, just having all the crazy practices, I mean, belief in relics, belief in virginity being superior, monasticism, uh, um, just exorcism, uh, sacrifice of the mass, all these things that we're going to get to next time, I suppose. But how did God let all that go for so long? It, it, it's just, it, it just beggars belief. Okay. So say you're speaking to a Catholic or even a Protestant mm-hmm. or an Orthodox even, but, but specifically a Catholic. And they say, I want to learn Augustine. Tell them w- where to start right now. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the confessions I think is a wise place to begin. Uh, it's an easy, but, but here's the thing. Way. That, that's that's very devotional and that's still a lot I, I think if you if you start with um I mean Augustine wrote some really good beginning source material like his his hand his his book on faith hope and love that's that's a wonderful work because it's is very that an Inchiridion? Inchiridion, uh-huh manual yeah, it's, which yeah, means that. manual. That's a good one. um his on Christian doctrine I mean he's wrote he's written that's a, a lot one. of beginner stuff um and I, I think uh, if you, you do the confessions, that's got, of course, his biography, autobiography in there. It's phenomenal. But just his basic manuals on Christian doctrine and, 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 his, and his manual on faith, hope, and love. I mean, that if that doesn't spark your thirst and love for God, I I don't know. Your, your, your heart's pretty cold. Or or maybe it just doesn't speak to you. There's a lot of fathers. If that's too much, you can dip into the uh, apostolic fathers, which are a lot smaller. Like Polycarp. Love Polycarp. He basically echoes Paul all the time. Ignatius's letters. I mean, these these guys are in the thick of persecution, so they've got Christianity on the ground with both sneakers running. Right? They're not doing highfalutin theology, but you see the Catholicism permeating while their 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 lives are being offered up to God. But um, what do you think of uh, Saint Augustine's book on the Trinity? 
Oh gosh, that's a very uh, that's very. I mean, I I I attempted attacking it. That's very um, from my puny brain. I think it's very advanced, and I don't. Yeah, is, and I'm not saying it's not readable. I'm just saying is it's very dense in information. Like I, <laughs> I, I I tried to get some Protestants to read it with me years ago, and I got them to read some things with me. But when we got into the Trinity, they just dropped off after like I don't know first couple of chapters. They just okay what convinced you of the papacy because it seems like you're getting higher church yeah like as you go but eventually well, I'll tell you, in, in, what in, sold you on the papacy yeah so so my my problem with the papacy wasn't that there was a pope i actually kind of had this romantic idealism i guess in, as an anglican i was almost probably a crypto papalist by the, near the end of those years there while i was in seminary because I felt like, geez, we're talking about bishops and patriarchs. But who's the patriarch of the West? Oh, that would be the Pope. <laughs> like, that's it would be some guy in Wagner Moscow. Would be, huh? That, that's what Christian Wagner said, because they teach in those yeah. high church Anglicans yeah. that the Pope is patriarch of the West. It's like, well, shouldn't we be l listening to him? <laughs> you know? I was trying to be consistent with myself, and I thought, well, how am I in relationship with this guy that I say is sort of, a, I'm officially on paper saying he's a patriarch. What does that mean? And uh, of course, my, I came into the church, you know, under Francis. It's funny, back in 2012, I, under Benedict, I was so close to converting, but I put the, put the brakes on because I, Benedict would have been a great pope to come under because, you know, it's, it's just far less scandal. There's far less to have to explain. You know, it was I just, he was, Benedict. I miss Benedict so much. And, and the but, worst uh, thing about this whole thing is that he's still alive. Yeah, that, it's it's so frustrating. frustrating thing. Yeah, and, yeah. And like, uh, like I remember, like, don't get me wrong. Pope Benedict was flawed, but yeah, absolutely. But but mm -hmm. but oh, just compared to the bone snapping stuff, I'm the, not going to get into it. The theological acuity that the, he was such a brainiac. I mean, his his Dominus Jesus is just really. I, I I don't know. The guy's brilliant. I got a, a lot of his books, and he's great. Anyway, uh, but I came under Francis, which means that I took seriously the claim that I've got to have some relationship with this patriarch. And uh, even though at the time I knew there was, you know, in 2017 when I decided to become a Catholic, I knew there was issues. You know, <laughs> it's an understatement. But what helped me was that, honestly, uh, I'll tell you, at that time, I was reading Eric Ibarra's uh, web, web blog, and he was talking about this stuff. And it was like, it felt like Catholics had a reasonable position of saying, you know, the Pope doesn't, he's not a direct line from God. He's not a direct oracle. So every time he says something, I don't have to take that as, as dogma, right? And I understand, I understand the nuances of like submission and all that. But the point was, it felt like the church had a little bit more of a dynamic relationship with the Pope than uh, just picking up a phone and finding what is he saying today? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like, for instance, the latest thing floating around, he's saying to Muslims, use the Quran as their sort of a guide to be uh, to be the best, you know, and he didn't say it this way, but as sort of a guide for your faith and whatnot. Like, I would never tell a Muslim to do that. I mean, I would never do it. But that's my Pope. As much as I don't like it, it's still my Pope and he's still Peter's successor. And the reality is, is I was convinced that uh, the church has got to be able to suffer through good popes and bad popes. I or I just come on, came under the conviction that if you have to start bishop hopping every time things get bad, you're you're basically buying into the seat uh, a state of a contest argument. Just well, start hopping around until until well, it's left. Like uh, the, there was an Orthodox youtuber once i won't say his name but he uh talked about he ha how he had switched jurisdictions for i i can't remember w w what he went to and then a couple months later oh the patriarch said some modernist i gotta go to a new jurisdiction now and i'm like yeah well, it, it's it's sure. endless and, and you'll be hopping forever so you know augustine again was a big help because when i was reading his anti-donatist writings and at this time and uh, his on the unity of the church. I mean, look, uh, I, I just, I just have to think, and I was talking with Eric about this. He so he was saying how, like, I don't, I don't think people would survive during the iconoclastic controversy. I don't know. Like you wake up one day and all of a sudden the Christian next to you, who doesn't believe in images is now anathema. 
Like, what do you do with that? You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's, it, you know, we, we have our modernism to deal with, which is a crisis and it's inf obviously infecting some of the, uh, the shepherds. But the reality is, is whatever our trying time is, our cross is, we've got to stay with the constitution of the church. You know, Calvin was arguing vociferously for, we, we have an escape hatch. We get to just kind of exist as the hidden church where you start hearing a lot of this talk about the hidden church. And it's like, it becomes uncomfortably Protestant in the way some people talk about it. And I'm like, mm, no, I, I don't believe Calvin was right. I don't believe Luther was right. I don't believe we can reconstitute ourselves in some way. We need what's there, even as much as it sucks at the moment. It's what we have. And um, it's easy to be revolutionary at your keyboard. <laughs> but, that way. but in practice, it's much harder to, to bear up the suffering of the church in the church. So. All right. My next question is, is kind of to do with your answer that you gave about Eric Ibarra, and that is, have you read Eric Ibarra's book on the papacy? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, almost halfway through it. I, this past week has been crazy with Thanksgiving. I did get it early on. I'm, I'm about uh, almost 50% done. So when I'm done with it, I'm going to do a nice little review on Amazon and I'll put some uh, posts out there. If anybody wants to talk about it, would love to talk about it. It's a great book. I mean, when I say it's a great book, I mean, Eric is, He's distilled so much information. There's 42 pages of, of bibliography in the back. So, I mean, and, and tons rife with footnotes. So this isn't some amateurish sort of endeavor. I mean, Eric has spent a long time assimilating this information. So I, I would say I put it up against, and I, I said this on Twitter, I, I had, I've had i had undergraduate and graduate level church history classes. This is one of the best, um, I'm not saying it's the best book ever, but it's, it is so accessible and it's so dense and it's so helpful especially in a time where we need to have frank conversations about the papacy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. And like, uh, like I'm w waiting for it cause I'm in Canada. Right. So in terms of shipping, I'm waiting for it to come on Amazon. Like it's right. on Amazon in Kindle form, but I kind of want yeah. a paper copy. I like the real deal. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, if it takes too long, uh, I, I could probably just wait for, uh, like I, I'd probably bite the bullet and order it off the site, but I think the shipping might be a bit expensive. Um, but no, like I really look forward to this, and it's what we need right now because yep. uh, we don't have the greatest successor of Peter. And there's been bad popes in the past, you know, like this. Uh, our answers in heaven here and complain how bad, but when they lived on there, yeah, no. Um, but I've got a final question, but before I ask the question, I want everyone in the chat, if you've got any questions, start popping them in the chat. We'll get to them. But my uh, last uh, question is, well, there's two questions, actually. Why do you think there's a current, um, like, uh, a current kind of war against saint augustine uh amongst the 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 eastern orthodox church uh the, the, it's like yeah he's a saint but there's kind of an asterisk after oh. that saint you know i'll so, I, I tell you what i, I got a, i got a quick story about that so it's going to answer your question so when i was becoming anglican back in 2000 around there I was visiting Byzantine Catholic services, uh, churches, as well as Antiochian. So I was looking into Orthodoxy at that time. I didn't get to that part of my story, but I was looking into Orthodoxy seriously because I was like, OK, I, I'm, I love Anglicanism, but maybe there's more out there. And uh, I was visiting a lot of Novus Ordo churches. I was, you know, but I Novus Ordo kept me away because it was, it was so scandalous to me. It, it seemed like, wow, this seems way lower church than what I'm doing as an Anglican. So I just. You know, plus priests tell me I don't have to convert. This is another story. But anyway, um, oh I went to an Antiochian church and there was a <laughs> there's a guy named there named Terry Mattingly. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a he's a, a, a newspaper I've writer. He, huh? Yeah, he's a, he does get religion. He, I mean, he's a brilliant guy. He's, he's a convert from Episcopalianism to Orthodoxy. So he was going to that church, the Antiochian church I was going to when I was visiting. And uh, we're having a nice discussion and whatnot. And I brought up Augustine. I was talking about Pelagianism and, and uh, predestination or whatever. I, I, I didn't think anything of it, but the people on the table kind of got, they had these sour look on their faces. Like, oh, you're talking about Augustine. You're talking about all this stuff. And 
I felt like, you know, I just felt like I told them, you know, their best friend died. Like it was really weird, just a very weird vibe. And I didn't know orthodoxy was very averse to this. I don't know where, the, I, and at the time I didn't know where the culture of this came from, but thankfully I, I started listening to um, Patrick Henry Reardon. He's a Western right Orthodox guy, you know, and he, he speaks favorably of Augustine and so on. But I, I'm, I mean, some people trace it to uh, early 20th century polemics against Catholicism. I don't, know exactly this out of my sphere of of expertise but uh it just seems unnatural to have such a venerated saint to be sort of hushed and sort of kind of the embarrassing saint or something it's just very strange to me you know so i don't know i really yeah. don't have the answer yeah <laughs> it's it's uh it's it's unfortunate like i think i know some of the the culprits behind it, John R R Romanides. Yeah, I was um, going to say that, but I wasn't sure if that was truly the source of it. Now, now I don't know if he's the source. I don't know if he started it, but he was right. certainly in that camp. Yeah, and 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 he actually goes after a few uh, Latin fathers apart from Augustine. He goes after Pope Le Leo the Great, even. Really? Like, he, yeah, bold. like How he bold. goes after. <laughs> yeah, no. So, so like there's kind of like like it's it, it's a shock how th the orthodox especially in the 20th century how they treat the the latin fathers it's like okay they're fathers but like if there's a latin opinion versus a greek opinion the greek wins every time you know what whereas catholics we don't treat the greek fathers like that we put right. them on and we venerate them yeah. exactly they're holy like the stuff they say about augustine i would never say about john chrysostom or or no. gregory of nisa or or who else it, it would be weird i mean these people we don't we're not worthy to untie their shoes like if a, a chrysostom came in or Augustus, i i would lose myself i, I just want to know what to do with myself that <laughs> these saints came in so i just think you know it's like we cover the nakedness if there's some defects or some they might have misspoke somewhere but there's still better theologians than I am. <laughs> so Amen. I'll Wait, take their defects. <laughs> so who is the smartest Protestant alive today? This is my last question. Smartest Protestant, like not minister or whatever, just Protestant period. Um, well, no, well, like, like the smartest. Theologian. Yeah. Oh gosh, you know, or, I mean, NT Wright or writer or whatnot. Yeah. I, I I think NT Wright's brilliant. I mean, I I think his stuff is phenomenal, but you know, maybe some people might not think so. Um, gosh, it's, I mean, I, I just don't read as much Protestant stuff as I used to for good reasons. But uh, uh, I know back in the day, I, I know Robert Raymond. I mean, he was a he was a seminary professor of mine, uh, Doctor Robert Raymond. He was a you know high five point Calvinist uh, PCA guy, Presbyterian, but hyper super lapsarian dude uh he was brilliant the guy was he was my hebrew professor actually and uh that guy was probably one of the smartest guys i ever met but i don't know i he's he passed on so i don't know who's alive today that would be that good i'm just not keeping up on the reformed protestant world so i hope this is a joke. james white. <laughs> <laughs> james white's smart but he's not that good <laughs> Okay, uh, 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 an interesting comment here. And we have William Albrecht's papacy book coming out too. Oh, I didn't know he had uh, yeah. a book coming. He does, actually. I I, uh, I I talk to William several times a week, or at least text him. And um, yeah, no, he's he's told me about this book. I can't wait to get to this one. Uh, like, Great, I love, I love his we, stuff. He's a, good, he's, he's a good guy. Yeah, he, it's co-authored with Father Coppus. Yeah, Coppus is um, brilliant. And um, all right, let's try to find some questions here. And then um, it seems like they're just talking to each other here. Um, the only this is. Uh... All right, here's a question. Is Stephen going to join the Catholic Apologetic Cinematic Universe and go and argue against Ortland and the other Paul publicly? Long story <laughs> short, are you going to start a YouTube channel? Yeah, look. Um... You know, it's funny about that. I, I, I used to absolutely love debating. Um, I don't mind, you know, talking, having a round table, but a, a formal debate. I mean, if they want to debate the papacy specifically, you know, there's much better people out there to do that. But if they want to talk about, 
specifically Protestant theology on justification and compared to the fathers. I would love to have those discussions. I mean, the other Paul, he seems like a really smart guy. Um, he is smart. Yeah. Yeah. He's a smart guy. Um, I, you know, I don't mind. Uh, it, it's, I guess with, with what I do nowadays, my, my, my big love nowadays is just um, literary apologetics, meaning I, I read through the great literature of, of, um, of the Western canon and um, just sort of uh, build bridges to Protestants that way to talk about the commonalities and then build them, build a case for Catholicism through literature, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, Holly Ordway, uh, Ordway, she's a recent convert. She does that. She works with Word, Word uh, uh, on Fire and things like that. There's a few people that have this, like Anthony Esselin as well. I mean, there's just so much... Uh, out there to help build bridges, to help all uh, Protestants see sort of what Catholics see. But with that said, I, I absolutely still love the, the hardcore theological stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll probably find a lot of common ground with some of these guys because I still believe in predestination and, and unconditional election. So I think that's good stuff. But um, yeah, if they want to debate justification or um, uh, merits, things like that, I'm a big fan of talking about uh, satisfaction and atonement of sins through almsgiving that's a that is something very common in the fathers um we could talk about that stuff but but at the end of the day protestant if they're a good protestant they'll say we don't care what does the bible say will be their only question so, um okay yeah. have you read john coloroffi's book so the, the book is keys over the christian w world have you read that book no no i don't i've never heard of it me, I've got this book in PDF. Apparently, you can find it in paper, but it's hard to find. Like, the only place I can see it is on Robertson Genesis website. Um, I've got the PDF, but I've not gone through it because, like, I've got really bad, like, really, really bad eyes. I can't read on a screen for like for paper it's fine for for paper yeah. i can read that's fine but like i can't read on a screen for more than say 20 m minutes yeah i hate reading uh, screen. Right, like if it's an article that's fine but like i i, I can't read long term so like um what's the premise few, of the book i what is it about oh it's it's uh apologetic for the papacy okay no i never heard of it yeah and so uh, yeah, like um, a few months ago, actually probably about a y y year ago, uh, Timothy Flanders sent me uh, the the PDF for the book that he, that he had coming out because he wanted an endorsement. So I re read it, but of course I've only got it in PDF. So like my eyes were just like bleeding. I'm like, oh, this is so good. I've got to keep reading, but my eyes are killing me. Uh, so no, I've not read keys over the Christian world. Um, there are some places I've heard that you can upload a PDF and get a bound book. I've thought about doing that with color book. I might do that too, but I, I'll be honest. I have a lot to read. I got a big list. Like yeah, uh, me too. I, I assume Steven does as well. Um, yeah, like, like r right now, my current project is I'm reading a lot of medieval, uh, Byzantine stuff nice. and I'm I'm basically putting together information to prove that the emperor for about three or four centuries was the essentially the post schism orthodox pope and like th this goes back into the early church too there's conflicts between the pope and the emperor like the Henoticon, yes. like uh like technically pope vigilius and emperor justinian although they believe the same thing it, it would just is it prudent to condemn these documents because it's going to scandalize people in the world. but then in the seventh century you got the monothelite the ecthesis imperial document the typos imperial document promoting heresy um of course at that time you had the pope to keep him in check though Post schism, there's no longer a pope to keep him in check. So he like some of the stuff I have found will make your jaw drop. Like like he Can was in fact, in fact in fact I'd argue that he had more authority than the pope had. Keep in wow. mind he had imperial authority on his side too. Uh, uh, like 
there's this w- w- one time where the the the, emperor, the only time, as far as I know, the emperor actually got excommunicated by the patriarch of Constantinople. It was in the 1260s with M- Michael the Eighth. And what does Michael do? Tells him to remove the excommunication. Patriarch says no. I'm removing you as patriarch. I'm putting my friend as patriarch. Now undo <laughs> my excommunication. Oh, yeah. you're good. You, you're good. I absolve you. You're back in the church. There you go. Let's find the right patriarch. Like, like, it, it, patriarch it's shopping. Game of, it's game of patriarchal thrones, really. You right. know, uh, keep hunting for that right bishop. <laughs> but there's there, and it goes a lot beyond appointing bishops. He he heads yeah. inquisitions, of course. Wow. They, they don't call them inquisitions, but that's a Latin word. But against the um, in um, in the 12th century, against the Boga Mills, and he solves doctrinal controversies and binds the church to doctrine, uh, nice. sometimes against the will of the unanimous consent to the bishops. Wow, what does this sound like? And he binds them <laughs> under pain of excommunication and yeah. death. Yeah. I have primary sources on this stuff. Yeah. And I'm going to do a presentation on this where I give all, I show you all the receipts. I'm, nice. uh, I, I've been talking with a, a Catholic apologist. I'm not going to say his name, but he has a channel with a lot more subscribers than me. And so I'm probably going to do it on his channel. So that way this stuff gets exposed. Because a lot of people don't know this. Uh, l- 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 like a lot of people don't know uh, how bad the, the Cedro Papism got in the East. Um, l- 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 like it got to, like, f- f- for example, Justinian is a saint in the Orthodox Church. His wife, who was a monophysite her whole life, who built monophysite monasteries, sent monophysites to convert the Chalcedonians, um, uh, basically opposed her husband on all his religious policy, is a saint in the, the modern Eastern Orthodox Church. And she's her saint. In fact, she's in the calendar. Even she's celebrated on the same day as as Justinian. And all that aside, she lived a wicked, immoral life. So I mean, <laughs> she, she she was a wicked, immoral monophysite, but she's a saint in the calendar. And they give us heck about Palamas being in our calendar, right? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it, it, it's huge double standards. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not like, you know, it's funny. It's like, I guess I, I have like five people on Twitter that I, I talk to that are Orthodox and, and I see there's a lot of heat going on in that realm. I'm just so far from that. To me, that just feels like another world. I, and I appreciate the people that are doing that apologetic because I, there's just so much I don't know about, you know, there's so much, the, the East is just so mysterious to me other than what I've learned, you know, on my travels, but I'm just so thoroughly Augustinian. It just, it didn't attract me. I, just, <laughs> I have such I have such Augustinian categories in my mind. I don't I, yeah, I don't track with Eastern Orthodoxy at all. So, but uh, yeah, she's beautiful. Yeah, no, because like I, um, for me, I I kind of I'm not part of that either. Yeah. But or at least I didn't want to be. But I know a lot of history, so a yeah. lot of people are saying, "Oh, Alan." Um, you you should respond to this and like this Orthodox because in in terms of like actual everyday life, there is no Eastern Orthodox apology. It's only online, uh, yeah. and like they have no presence in substantially in America or Canada or pretty much anywhere in North or South America. Uh, there's a few old y- y- Ukrainian farming communities in my province. You know, you- you'll be driving through the country. There's like an onion dope. But those people aren't going to d- yeah. try to convert you l- yeah. like these online people. Oh, but yeah, no, I, I, but like, like, yeah. I was going to say, I can tell you that from firsthand. When I, w- I went to a Russian Orthodox church back in 2000, 2001 around there, and I talked to the Russian Orthodox priest. I asked him about, should I be converting? I just I just put it right out there. Should I convert? He said, we don't want you to convert. We want you to ask God if he wants you to convert. And so I took that as a no. I was like, okay. 
Well, sadly, <laughs> well, well, sadly, a lot of Catholic priests will do that too. Oh, yeah. I got the same thing from a Catholic priest. I just thought it'd be a different answer from the uh, Orthodox guy. Just no, it wasn't really any different. It was very and and I saw a lot of liberalism in the Antiochian context. I don't know. It, it just felt like I was seeing a lot of the same stuff as I was seeing in the Novus Ordo world. So, oh, John, uh, uh, a couple uh, about ten minutes back, we're talking about y your book, Keys Over the Christian World. So uh, yeah, if you will. Oh, this is the author. Oh hi. Yeah, I, I thought the guy was dead. I didn't know. No, <laughs> I didn't know this was a new book. Alive. Sharp guy. Sorry. Um. All right. Uh. Question. Well, what do you guys believe about the veneration of Palamas? I'm obviously against it. I support it because the church supports it. Like I, I do believe that uh, the sacraments and God's grace aren't bound by the the walls of the church. Uh, now that's the n n normative means. That's the normative means. Like if you want to go to heaven, you need to convert, uh, accept Christ fully and be baptized. But um, yeah, no, like I do think uh, God is not bound by the r r r rules that he gives us. And sometimes he can work m miracles and the church can recognize the miracles like in the case of um of polymus you, you, you got something to say about that Stephen? no i i have no opinion about polymus all i know is i i watch a lot of videos about palimism and uh <laughs> i i mean i tell you i'm i'm so in the woods of, of western theology to me it's like i not that i'm saying it's not important i just don't have an opinion about it if if the church says he's a saint and we can venerate him i'm okay with it I have and, no formal objection. I don't know. Is he is he supposed to be a heretic or something? Well, I, I he he he's not ever been condemned as a heretic. Okay. But I mean, but something I just want to say that as someone who's actually read Palamas's works, or at least the yeah. some that's available in English, yeah. um, there's a a gap between what Palamas says. And what some z z zealous online apologist who has a YouTube channel says, like, if you want to learn about Palamas, go and read his his. Get the dialogue with the Barlamite, get the triads, and go read them. Like I read this stuff, I'm not that offended by it. I just think, oh, this is interesting. It's a bit different, but I don't think it's dangerous or anything. But. Uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, it's, so, it's a mystery so to me. Some, All that stuff's a foreign country. <laughs> yeah, so if some guy wants to tell you about that, just say, "Look, I'll just go and re and read Palamas myself." You yeah, know? That's I'm just so I'm still in the in the first you know 500 years here. I mean, I, I mean, I haven't digested uh, Chrysostom all the way. It's like, I mean, those are the Eastern guys I like, you know. So I, I don't know. I'm not even there yet. <laughs> so I feel, yeah, no, I feel that's... trouble, but. It's not a fight that I, I have. Okay. Um, but why is he worthy of veneration? Well, the same reason every saint's worthy of, of veneration. Uh, Theodor had his famous line about Rome from St. Irenaeus. Never. Oh, okay. He must be answering some of that. But I, I, I think we're out of questions. We've gone almost yeah. two hours. Um, we've, we've got a pretty good v viewership now but keep in mind we were competing with the other paul and craig true yeah no uh, competition. so i mean uh, so that's hard to do so i mean like i'm just gonna check if they're still going on other paul's channel yeah they got 79 viewers you know they're yeah well i mean maybe, <laughs> maybe next time I... we can maybe next time we can go over the list i have like 20 things augustine talks about that's explicitly catholic that we will do a Isn't video just on one off, but we can do that next time if you want. We will do that next time. Uh, so have you got any last words for, for our audience before we, uh, mm -hmm. we, we kill the stream? No, thank you. Uh, no, I loved it. Every minute of it. I hope it was okay for you. Um, thank you everybody for listening, whoever's out there. And, uh, and one last thing, please pray for Ryan Grant's wife, Sarah. Um, it's here on Twitter space. I, I love that guy. His wife, of course, you may know was uh, diagnosed with cancer and we're all praying for her and there's a donation out there. Yeah, please. And uh, he's a great guy. And um, that's all.
God bless you, Alan. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it, brother. All right. God bless you, Stephen. All right. Take care. Bye.